This is done for the first time on the initiative of the Minister of Justice, Alexander Kalnavalov. We decided to organize such an event and four countries uh, show their interest in demonstrating their achievements and the development of their legal systems for the benefit of investments, for uh, ensuring a transparent situation for all the participants of the uh, business and economic life. Thank you uh, very much. I would like to welcome, so I would like to wish success to all of the participants, to all of the speakers, and I hope that the next year, 2013, will uh, be the year in which we will see the presentations of all the 50 or more countries who will take part in the in the um, forum. We will uh, do it in the alphabetical order, and France is the first. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames, Messieurs. Dear Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is such an unusual place that we uh, see that uh, it seems that as if we were at some sort of a sports competition. It is a kind of an arena for some sort of show, but I hope that still we will be able to communicate in a friendly environment as good friends and colleagues in order to exchange opinions about our legal systems. I would like to first of all tell you that we are extremely pleased and it is also a great privilege for us to be invited uh, to such a forum in this country which has found force to overcome the legacy of the past to undertake radical reforms of its institutions at the same time preserving its national identity and preserving its place in the community of great powers of the world and today Russia still has to prove that it is a truly democratic country and that in this country justice is at a correspondingly high level. That the system of justice is strong and serves the law ensuring the observance of all of the same rules and freedoms for each and every citizens, citizen. I was lucky because for a number of decades I was observing the evolution of changes that have been taking place in judiciary institutions. Those particular institutions that are in place in order to uphold justice. Our work, our joint work, needs to be further improved, and such meetings as this one are very helpful in that respect. It is great that we take interest in what is going on in other countries and it is a pleasure today to have an opportunity to discuss the French legal, legal system and I would like to give you a brief overview of how the system works in France. Since I don't have too much time I will focus on the most important things as I see them. All the more so as the president of the International Notary Union will then take the floor and complement my presentation. Our legal system 
is characterized by a high level of flexibility. It adapts to changes in the society quite easily. This has been reflected throughout the French history. It, the system evolved over the time. At first it was a system of justice that was concentrated around the monarchy and it was the king who uh, delivered justice. Then it became the justice of the people. The system of justice has gone a long way from justice in the name of subjects of the crown to justice in the name of citizens of the republic. Since the times of uh, Louis, well, this uh, uh, system has evolved, and the at uh, the time of uh, the at uh, the age of the Enlightenment, uh, very significant advancements were carried out. In Article 8 uh, of the Declaration of uh, Human Rights and Freedoms of uh, 1979, uh, there is a principle of uh, no uh, of, uh, of the of the um, uh, denial of retroactivity. And the law of 1790 divided two branches of the judicial authority. One branch took care with criminal and civil cases, and the other dealt with administrative cases. We also instituted uh, the jury, the, the tri trial by jury. Uh, we also created cassation court, which observes whether the laws are conformed with in the course of uh, litigation. Continuing the, uh, the cause of revolution, Napoleon, who was pronounced the Emperor of France in 1804, created a special body that is called the State Council. This council still plays a decisive role in the harmonization of our system of justice on the basis of, of our um, civil code, the Napoleon, Napoleonic co co code, the trade code, or rather the commercial code, and the uh, uh, criminal and procedural code and the penal code. until. Uh, the middle of the 20th century, the uh, judicial system in France uh, did not change since the times of uh, Napoleon, but in 1958, General de Gaulle came into power and he wanted to make sure that the system of justice and the people uh, involved in delivering justice to play a worthy role in the society. Uh, the judicial core was formed out of the graduates of uh, the higher school of magistrates and the judicial system in France was significantly reformed. We did away with the uh, tradition and in the Constitution of 1958, and starting since that time, we have within our judicial system a constitutional council. This is the time of the Fifth Republic in France, which of course is characterized by certain specific uh, features for France. We have two branches within the system of judiciary. The administrative branch, which deals with uh, cases against administrative bodies. It has, well, it is a special branch of the judiciary, and in case certain disputes arise between citizens and administrative body, bodies, uh, it is up to the administrative courts to uh, take up and consider such cases. The Administrative Council 
the administrative court rather, consists of eight judges, half of them are members of the Cassation Court. If we take the other branch of the judiciary, the civil and criminal branch, those courts deal with civil disputes and criminal cases, and they also monitor uh, the protection of human freedoms and rights. We also have uh, district or county courts for civil cases. There are 160 of those, 37 courts of appeal, and one court of cassation. In the courts of the first instance, criminal and uh, civil courts are divided into two categories. District and county courts for civil cases, which uh, hear civil proceedings that do not fall within the sphere of remit of criminal lords. Uh, district courts uh, well, uh, uh, they are uh, also uh, divided into two categories uh, by the territory. Uh, the uh, district courts take up courses, uh, cases starting from 10,000 euro, approximately, uh, and they also uh, hear cases irrespective of the amount of the claim in the field of inheritance, for example. As far as criminal procedure is concerned, crimes such as rape or murder that must be tried by jury and usually such uh, Uh, well, there are courts uh, where trial by jury is carried out. There are also some specialist courts, both in the civil and the and criminal domain, which sometimes uh, take decisions by uh, one uh, judge. Coming back to county civil courts that take uh, cases from up to 10,000 euro. We can um, here mention various uh, disputes related to um, the lease of plots of land, and at this level they also try minor violations of the criminal nature, which do not lead to dire consequences. For example, uh, uh, light bodily harm and uh, so on and so forth. There are so-called commercial courts that uh, hear disputes between businessmen and there are also commercial courts of arbitration that um, look into the cases between employers and employees. Courts of appeal have only professional ju judges. Those are courts of the first instance, and they handle uh, those claims that they receive. So these uh, cases are handled uh, in substance by the courts of the first and the second instance, and those decisions that are taken by the Court of Appeals can also be sent for cassation, and in that case they are transferred to the Court of Cassation. One out of ten decisions of, the court of, of a Court of Appeal ends up in the Court of Cassation, which is the highest instance of the, our um, judiciary system. It takes a decision on whether or not the entire procedure was in conformity with the law with regard to a particular case. There is only one court of cassation, and the judges of the court of cassation observe 
that uh, the entire process of uh, the court case hearing um, should be in line with the law, but they do not take any decisions on the substance of the matter. Thus, they demonstrate that if there is an abuse and of a miscarriage of justice, they may override the judgment awarded by the Court of Appeal and hand it over to another Court of Appeal to retry a case. And this decision is final and cannot be appealed. This is the profile of the French judiciary, the judiciary system of the French Republic. As I have mentioned at the beginning, the time that we are currently living is connected with certain challenges. And there are lots of issues pertaining to the judiciary in a free democratic society. This system must be adapted to new challenges and it must be up to the level of confidence rendered by the public at large. The French judiciary system is subject to certain changes. On the one hand, globalization and development of international ties do have an influence on our judiciary system. Of course, we are talking about the development of the European process in economy and other spheres. But preserving the traditions of the French law, we try to adapt our decision as much as possible and to identify appropriate solutions so that we are in conformity with the changing times. In our decisions, we are absolutely sure that the judiciary is a product of the rich French history. It is rooted in the Roman law, and it is also a product of a special way of the French people that has never been isolated and has always been open to universal human trends of development. Our judiciary system is based on the Declaration of Human Rights of 1789. We are inspired by René Casson and other outstanding humanists. And the words that were pronounced in 1948 during the setting up of the United Nations. We have developed a system that is efficient and operationable, and it is within the traditions of our system to think in such a way so that everything is codified for two purposes, to ensure transparency and a uniform system of rules. We appeal to our citizens and we see it as a high mission for any lawyer. We think that we manifest the will of our people and we provide for the enjoying of human rights through judicial ways when awarding specific judgments. We are also an instrument of saving time and money as our judiciary is clear and it simplifies people's life in case them, they come across the infringement of their rights. Based on these features, we see an opportunity for the country to develop legislation that would be in compliance with the established objectives. This legislation is amended and improved on a regular basis. 
The advantage of this legislation is also manifested through codification, which is typical of civil law countries. This codification documents statutory norms and standards and allows us not only to identify quick and structures, re, structured responses to the challenges that pop up during the development of the society, but also our court practice provides for the constant monitoring of the changes that are connected to a lot of factors, namely to be flexible and to be efficient is important. As one of the authors of the civil law, Mr. Portalis, used to say, there can't be an integrated work until all the small details are put together. The Court of Cassation that I represent is the most important instrument in the legal system, since it guarantees equality of all in front of law, accessibility of law, predictability of law, thus ensuring security, equality, and flexibility. So this is the power of our judiciary system that is enriched with its judiciary system features. In terms of the process, a special place is occupied by judges that work not as passive nails and screws, but they also provide for the equality of the parties in a litigation, and they are governed exclusively by law. A judge provides, in conformity with their functions, efficient operations of the bodies they are working for. For example, 75% of cases that are handled in France are cases on the matter compared to 5% of such cases in the United States. So we are trying to simplify the operations of our courts and procedural rules of court hearings and court procedures in France are based on the system, which is quite accessible and that benefits not the rich people of the society, but the public at large. And it is typical of any stage of a litigation. So this accessibility of the French legal system is provided for starting from the first instance up to the litigations in the Court of Cassation. As for the Cassation process, which is not uh, judging a case on the matter and that handles absolutely all cases. We are working in very tough time frameworks. We have only six months to formulate our judgment on any case handed over to the Cassation Court. And after six months, our court is to award a judgment. The same time frame work we have for the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court judges a case on its 
substance. Also, we have to meet certain deadlines for courts of appeals, and civil courts have four months to handle cases. To provide for such outcomes, uh, the French legal system is looking for new tools of work. And in this way, we are faced with the procedure of dematerialization of the procedures. And for a number of years in the Court of Concession, we are able to speed up our procedures. And besides, a similar process is evolving in other bodies, whatever degree they are. Apart from figures at the structural level, it is necessary to identify new features for the state-of-the-art judiciary. Justice can be administered only in case if the independence is provided for as well as high quality experts are involved. French judges have a very much protected status. Of course, they cannot be removed and they are appointed on their merit and at the advice of the higher court of magistrates, which is an independent body because neither the Minister of Justice nor the President of the Republic are members of this body and they cannot interfere with this higher council, which makes an absolutely dependent decision at its own discretion. Uh, this higher council is independent, which is a, a very important factor. Professionalism of judges is guaranteed by their education. I have already emphasized the fact that we have a national school of judges that provides for the uniform training of 30 to 31 months, and this is the longest training period for uh, governmental officials. So the school has the longest training period. On the other hand, this school provides for professional development of judges, which is a mandatory thing. And as a rule, the professional development must take at least one week a year. Another important factor is attestation of judges by chairs of the courts or chief justices. And this is very important to build up confidence of the public at large. They can appeal directly to the High Council of Magistrates to complain about certain judges' behavior. So we need to build up this trust. This is an important factor that cannot be but overlooked uh, that cannot be overlooked in the in a democratic society because otherwise it infringes the principles of the society we are an old uh, based on tradition system but we need to adapt to new challenges and requirements and we think that the french system is very good at uh, its adaptation uh, pertaining to the uh, uh, growing number of cases and a more international nature of cases. Its own quality allows the system to meet the challenges that it faces, including challenges pertaining to simplified procedures. That unfortunately, these procedures are not easier. And now I would like to hand the floor to Mr. Renaud, the Chairman, High Council of French Notariat. Thank you very much, dear Chair of the Court of Cassation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it is a great privilege for me to speak after Mr. Chair Lamanda. And I would like to highlight some of the aspects of our judiciary system. 
uh, as a system built on the continental system. The French legal system is based on continental law, as you know, the main characteristic of which are as follows. It is codified law, which is uh, <coughs> spelled out in various pieces of legislation. The main uh, part of this system of codification is, of course, the civil code, but this codification is not rigid. It is constantly improved and it allows to upgrade and update the laws if and as necessary. Because the law is codified, you can easily learn what it is all about. Uh, any citizen, any businessman can read the code and see what kind of legal requirements can be applicable to him or her. This uh, rule is clearly understood. Each uh, rule is formulated in general terms that are generally understandable, which ensures legal security. And this legal security is a huge advantage for citizens because you can envisage and predict the outcome of a dispute resolution and therefore you can decide whether it is worthwhile or not to file a case with a court of law. So uh, contracts uh, also have uh, binding nature in our system. Uh, so not, no, notarial act um, dominates over other texts. Uh, it is at the top of the system of evidence. This, uh, we have, our law ensures effective transactions with real estate because there is a system of publishing in a certain register of all deals, and since there is preliminary legal control, which is carried out by a professional, by a notary public, those are professionals. What kind of, what, what are they in France? All legal professions are share the same uh, main professional principles. They are independent. These professionals, of course, must maintain uh, the principle of confidentiality and they must keep up public interest. I will remind you uh, about the main legal profession and if, and if you allow me, I will speak a little bit more about the profession I represent, notaries. So, lawyers, as in all countries of the world, uh, in France, uh, lawyers are universal in terms of their education and methods of work that they employ. Those are people who help to administer justice, they provide advice to their clients, they protect their clients, be it private persons or They protect individual freedoms. They protect the, uh, the state that is based on the rule of law. And since they are free from the state, they are free from any influence from those quarters. They on only serve the interests of their clients. And they, of course, must maintain professional secrets. And they cannot uh, get involved in a situation of a conflict of interest. As far as bailiffs are concerned, in the continental law, we have this special kind of lawyers. They notify procedural acts, and they, of course, are involved in the execution of the decisions taken by courts. Their status is similar to that of notaries, and today, we have uh, a set of documents that define the gist of this legal profession. This is such a uh, participant in the system of justice which carries out tasks related to the administration of justice, and they also act on the orders from the judge. They have special responsibilities, and uh, they have two functions execution of court rulings and also notification about court rule rulings. 
in France the principle of notification is a principle according to which the bailiff must hand in, in person, the uh, court ruling involving that particular person. Some functions of that kind are also performed by uh, court secretaries or registrars. Uh, bailiffs can also have certain property rights in relation to several persons. They carry out activities that are strictly regulated by the law in order not to infringe upon the provisions of the law. This profession is absolutely indispensable, which uh, contributes quite a lot in the functioning of the system of justice. There are also uh, professionals who are at the same time lawyers and managers, and their task is to help those enterprises that are um, at risk of going bankrupt. The French uh, judicial system or, or uh, justice system also has the legal profession of a notary amongst its ranks. The continental uh, law is preventive law, in w within which the notary plays a very special role. It is appointed by the state in order to prove the authenticity of various acts. The tasks that he is entrusted with is carried out in a liberal context, meaning that a French notary has a double status. On the one hand, it is uh, a person authorized by the state. He is in possession of a state seal. He acts on behalf of the state and under the state control. But at the same time, he is a representative of a free profession, freelance profession, he must manage uh, his or her employee as any other employer and out of his or her own accord. In line with the tasks entrusted to notaries by the state, they must perform five functions. They must uh, approve uh, contracts between parties. It means that he um, testifies that the acts are in line with the legislation in force. He, of course, has to test those acts or agreements for conformity with law, because uh, those agreements will be a kind of a law governing the relations between the parties henceforth. So one of the uh, tasks of the notary is to check whether the parties are in agreement that they are legally capable and they have uh, the, uh, appropriate authorities to undertake commitments. So uh, after all these checks, the notary signs the act assuring its authenticity. This procedure, thanks to the entire, to the transparency of the entire procedure helps us to understand who is the owner of this or that property, who are members of this or that organization or corporate entity. We know who owns what, and we can combat thereby such crimes as money laundering or mm, corruption. Authentication of uh, acts also helps the state to e e to collect taxes and charges that are levied, say, on insurance, on inheritance, or if a company changes its form of ownership. Uh, notaries also uh, are tax collectors. They have to calculate the tax, collect it, and uh, transfer it to the government. Otherwise, he will be held responsible uh, with all his or her assets or maybe through an insurance that he has. He must also keep those acts uh, in proper order so that they could reproduce if necessary. All uh, notarial acts must be kept for 75 years. In that way, we can uh, prove that the existence of
commitments and responsibilities between various parties, no matter how long those commitments were, how long ago those commitments were undertaken. Those acts are very important as evidence of direct application during court hearings, and they also help us to restore the history of owners of this or that property. But the role of the notary is broader. He also acts as an editor, or um, yes, uh, because it is uh, a notary's task to uh, uh, write the acts, write the deeds. So initially, uh, the word notary meant editor or a person who puts together various deeds, and this still remains a very important action, a function of uh, the military. He helps parties to express their will and their goals so that they could understand what kind of uh, responsibilities are created on the basis of a deed. He must consult the parties, he must tell them about their obligations, and he must check that what uh, the, the party state is in fact what they are trying to uh, achieve. This uh, function of advice is also very important from the point of view of interacting with the state. Where, wherever we have notariates, uh, the government uses uh, the institution of notaries to ensure first legal security and second social harmony we can say, say that in many countries we see a growth in the number of cases uh, tried by courts and very often there is a trend to resolve many um, controversial issues in a court of law what are the expectations of simple citizens they don't want this usually they don't want to have too many cases tried in court. They want to live a peaceful life and legal action uh, take a long time, they cost a lot, they produce a lot of impression on people and sometimes a victory in a court case is uh, an illusion and the role of notaries is to avoid if possible a court hearing of a case by authenticating appropriate deeds. The notary checks all applicable legislative provisions with regard to a contract. He must be assured that everything is in accordance with the law and he plays a role of a regulator in a business economy, a role that is absolutely indispensable, especially after the mortgage crisis and after the economic outbreaks that we are very well aware of. Unfortunately, different checks may be carried out by a notary, but something may still be not in conformity with law, and there certain problems may, create, may, may, may evolve. In Western Europe, on average, one deed out of 1,000 is disputed in court, while in the United States, a deed related to real estate has 50 times great, has a 50 times greater chance to become a subject of a court hearing. Notaries must be objective. Notaries must be uh, a lawyer. My must be lawyers of a certain standing, but and not of a certain client. And the advice they provide must be in the public interest, uh, in the interest of both parties, be it a buyer or a seller or a borrower or an heir, participant in this or that company. All of them have the right for the same quality of advice from a notary. So a notary must be impartial. Sometimes it's quite difficult to ensure that both advice is 
right and impartial. At the same time, the checkup that is carried out must be equal with regard to any party. He must not act for the benefit of one of the customers. They need to ensure the balanced nature of a contract, of an obligation. So it must, they must protect the vulnerable parties, for example, consumers versus producers, and all commitments must be met. So the role of a notary may be compared to a justice of peace that allows us to align parties' opinions while striking the interests of both the parties, all the parties. In conclusion, I would like to say the following. We often say that the modern world is changing, but each time a country is opening up to liberal approaches when freedoms are given to the public at large, in this freedom context, a choice has to be made with regard to whether a notary system must be adopted or not. And many countries opt for it because it provides for legal security and st striking balances. Questions, please? Are there any questions? It seems that there are no questions. Oh, since there are no questions, okay. Okay, we do have a question. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I would like to welcome you and command the quality of your presentation. It was very clear. You know better than I do that any system, even a very complex one, has weak points. And if you allow me, I would like to ask you to talk about the weaknesses of the French system. I will be happy to do it. It's true. In my opinion, our system does have considerable weakness related to its history, namely a large number of different specialized courts of the first instance that include professional judges, and we also have judiciary bodies that consist of lay judges that are not professional lawyers. Several years ago, we carried out a reform reorganizing the judiciary. It was called the reform of the court map. And unfortunately, I had to say that unfortunately, this reform did not simplify the structure of the French judiciary system. So uh, no uniform bodies of the first degree were created. Of course, there might be specialized chambers that include professional judges that may be assisted by elected or appointed experts given their independence. Unfortunately, the weight of history, the weight of traditions of certain corporate habits 
didn't allow this reform that was about geographically grouping of certain judiciary bodies to be implemented. Thus, the first instance was not simplified, and it is quite complex. As for this second instance, courts of appeals, they have only professional judges, and as for the Cassation Court, obviously, it also includes only professionals. So we do have problems with the first instance, while we don't have the problems with the instances further. But we need to work at the first instance to make sure that our judiciary system is more clear to our public at large, because today, without the help of experts, they sometimes cannot find an appropriate court to which they need to file a claim. So we need to be more responsive with regard to the interests of our ordinary citizens. So this is one of the weaknesses, if we can, we, uh, we can call it a disadvantage, and it needs to be corrected and uh, more integrated reform is required. If you allow me, another weakness that is felt by me as a law professional is the proliferation of the law. Our lawmakers produce too many laws. Very often, laws are about nothing. And over the recent years, there has been a tendency to regulate everything by law. So no initiative is resorted to the contracting parties. There is a trend for wider regulations. And they are overlapping. They duplicate each other. They are not clear. So, unfortunately, we do have a trend amongst the lawmakers to respond to each difficulty in a society with adopting a certain law. So, we think that this is a disadvantage, and notaries and lawyers that uh, are actually serve for the benefit of the enforcement of laws and they must interpret laws to their customers come across serious difficulties when you have four laws on taxation a year adopted it is not easy even for us to understand what is it what it is about so this is from my point of view a problem Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Prosecution Office, what are relations with the Ministry of Justice? I would like to say that the peculiarity of our Prosecution Office is that it is actually also part of the judiciary system. Uh, expert prosecutors are trained by the same school, but they are officials of the prosecution office. The prosecution office is headed by the public prosecutor. In the Court of Appeal, we have prosecutor general and he cannot replace the prosecutor of the Republic. If a lawsuit is initiated by an ordinary prosecutor, this investigation cannot be cancelled by the prosecutor general. And if the prosecutor doesn't want to continue the, uh, their prosecution, uh, no orders can be released, issued by the prosecutor general. Obviously, the prosecutor general has certain prerogatives. Well, in theory, uh, these powers are broader, and hierarchically, he is subordinate to the Ministry of Justice of our country, which complicates the situation in our country, giving rise to a number of problems, because judges are independent, while prosecutors are not completely independent. <laughs> 
So, we do have a non-pleasant situation in this community. We need actually to break the linkage between the executive branch, the Minister of Justice, and the prosecutors, or we need to break the linkage between the judges and the prosecutors. Probably the latter one should be taken care of. As for the linkage between prosecutors and ministers, in some countries we do have such subordinations, in other countries we do not have it. Well, there is a heated debate in our country, and over the last two years, the previous president of the Republic made a certain decision. Since the prosecutor is appointed by the higher council of magistrates, it was decided that the opinion of this council will never be infringed. So this approach was cancelled, which means that the prosecutor is appointed by the decision of the High Council of Magistrates, which means that the executive branch, the Ministry of Justice, has lost certain powers pertaining to the appointment of the prosecutor. Well, they can nominate a candidacy, but uh, what counts is the final opinion of the High Council. So the former president put it in his election program. He wanted to implement this reform with regard to the High Council so that the opinion of the Council is properly taken into account. The new president also retained this part in his election program, and obviously it will result in revising the Constitution in the next couple of years. He said that he prefers this decision under which the opinion of the higher council will be taken into account with regard to judges and prosecutors. We are not an independent part in this party in this situation, but Neither are we uh, free from the executive branch because the terms of appointment and disciplinary issues are related to the appointment of judges and discipline of judges. Of course, our system is not perfect, so this situation is quite debatable. The court in Strasbourg indicated that members of the prosecutor's office are not members of the judiciary to the extent that only the judiciary can make a decision on arresting or imprisonment of citizens. So, obviously, in this sense, we must think how to simplify the powers of the prosecutors to be in conformity with the democratic principles of societies. So this is a standby situation. It is evolving, but it is a gradual evolution, rather slow. And we must either be striving for more independence, like in Italy, but in Italy there is a principle of the legitimacy of criminal prosecution, while in France the issue of factors resulting in a prosecution is of paramount importance. So different solutions can be made. Either we should opt for the Italian approach or to choose some other way. So we are in a sort of transition to the extent that there are certain rules in terms of discipline and appointment of prosecutors, and at the same time, 
prosecutors are not given more independence in their actions. They are still linked and subordinate to the Ministry of Justice. Though it is difficult to provide certain guidelines, you know, the political, uh, the, the government is very much concerned and unsure about the situation because everything becomes known immediately. So it is difficult to identify the uh, actual development for the nearest years, but obviously it will take place. If there are no more questions, we are very grateful to you for your attention and we are handing over to our German counterparts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation of the French judiciary system. And now we are handing over to Dr. Frank Engelmann, lawyer, president of the Brandenburg Regional Bar. So, dear friends, please turn your chairs to the opposite screen where Dr. Frank Engelmann is ready to present the legal system of Germany. I would like to thank my French counterparts for the splendid presentation. And I hope that I won't abuse your time. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present the German uh, legal system. I'll speak in English. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present the German legal system to such a distinguished audience. Made in Germany is not just a quality seal reserved for German products, it is equally applicable to German law. Our law protects private property and civil liberties. They grant, thank you, they guarantee social harmony and economic success. The attractiveness of German law and the expertise of German legal professionals are recognized internationally. After the fall of the Iron Curtain, many Eastern European countries used the German civil code as well as German corporate law as models for their civil and commercial legislation. For more than 10 years, Germany has closely cooperated with China in the so-called rule of law dialogue. Within the framework of this dialogue, German and Chinese legal experts work together on the drafting of new laws in Germany. In 2009, the German government started a rule of law dialogue with Vietnam in order to modernize the legal system of Vietnam and to facilitate the integration of Vietnam into the international legal community. Not only the German government, but also the German legal profession strives to promote German law internationally. In 2008, the associations of German legal professionals, namely the German Federal Bar, the Federal Chamber of German Civil Law Notaries, the German Judges Association, the German Notaries Association and the German Bar Association, have founded the Alliance for German Law. The objective of the Alliance Alliance for German Law is to draw public attention to the benefit of German law and to promote German law as a locational advantage. One of the products 
of the alliance is the brochure law made in Germany that we have brought with us and that you are welcome to take with you. This year, the Association of German Chambers of Industry and Commerce has entered the Alliance for German Law. With this strong partner, the message of the Alliance will be spread out worldwide across the international offices of the German Chambers of Industry and Commerce and across the German companies that operate internationally. Germany is now as an export nation. In terms of law, it is not our objective to export or to sell our law. It is not about transferring German law one-to-one -one into another legal system, not an attempt of legal imperialism. Our endeavors are all about offering the suitable solutions to our partner countries and finding realistic implementation options considering their legal system and cultural backgrounds. In the competition of legal systems, it is all about the best legal argument, and there are many strong arguments in favor of German law. For entrepreneurs, German law constitutes a genuine competitive advantage because it is predictable, affordable, and enforceable. In our opinion, German law, due to its continental European tradition, is a more than suitable model for transformation countries that are looking for legal solutions for their changed environments. After the Second World War, it was German law that helped facilitate the economic miracle of West Germany. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, German law assisted in the transformation of East Germany. Today, prosperity and democracy prevail throughout Germany. In large measure, we owe this success to our law. German law was highly rated by the Global Competitiveness Report 2011-2012 of the World Economic Forum that listed Germany among the top five nations in the efficiency of legal framework category. German law belongs to the long-standing family of continental European legal systems in the tradition of Roman law. This also includes the legal system of Central and Eastern Europe. This legal family is characterized by its codified system of legal provisions in the form of statutes in Germany. All important legal issues and matters are governed by a comprehensive legislation in the form of statutes, codes, and regulations. The most important legislation in the area of business law includes the civil code, the commercial code, the private limited companies act, the public limited companies act, the act of unfair competition. German law is predictable and reliable. The legislator sets the systemic and structural parameters while lawyers and civil law notaries use the law to shape and organize specific situations. Codification provides legal certainty as legislation contains general principles and guidelines and defines the terminology used. There are specific statutes that lay down rules for individual, individual types of contracts, such as contracts of sale. German law provides general catch-all provisions that apply in cases 
where the contractual parties have not agreed otherwise. Therefore, not only are contracts under German law more concise, they are also more cost-effective and reliable than contractual agreements under English or US law. Codification enables swift and straightforward access to the law. This also facilitates the search of relevant court rulings and their comprehension, as legal literature always comments on judicial decisions under the category heeded by the codified provision applied by the court. Contract law in particular benefits from the division of functions between legislator and the users of the law, as opposed to jurisdictions based on case law. Codification provides reliable guidelines when drafting and interpreting contracts. The basic structures of contracts of sale are prescribed by law. However, in keeping with the principle of contractual freedom, the parties are of course free to agree on different provisions. In contrast to English law, a con a contract under German law requires no detailed provisions and definitions on issues such as right of retention, set off or assignment, unless the contract expressly stipulated otherwise. The statutory provisions will apply. German contracts of sale are therefore considerably more conscious than comparable contracts under English law, saving parties valuable time and substantial legal fees. German company law offers a suitable legal structure for every type of business. As a rule, German company law distinguished between partnerships and corporation limited by shares. As an entrepreneur, you can select it, the most suitable legal form depending on the object of the company, the intended role of your shareholders, the flexibility required for the structuring of the articles of association and, to a certain extent, tax-related criteria. Germany company law is continuously being adapted to the needs and requirements of business, industry and trade. In 2008, for example, the German law on provide limited companies was completely updated. It is now even easier and more straightforward to form and run a GmbH. In addition to GmbHs, German law provided for the Unternehmergesellschaft UG, an entrepreneurial company with limited liability, which can be formed with a nominal capital of only one euro. These mini GmbHs have proven a successful innovation, in particular business startups with limited seats capital, who before the interaction of UGs often fell back on the British private company limited by shares, as their chosen legal form no largely opt for the Unternehmergesellschaft. A unique selling point of the German legal system, it is public registers maintained by judges and registrars, which ensure legal certainty in the areas of commercial law and land law. In fact, this is a particular feature of the German legal system that other countries are striving to emulate. A reliable database is avail available to German and foreign investors, forming the basis of any commercial activity. The commercial register provides information 
on sole traders and trading companies and on the persons who can validly represent these businesses in legal transactions. Anyone can inspect the commercial register online. Questions such as whether a business partner validly exists or who can represent an organization and signed on its behalf can be answered very quickly without any need for costly legal opinions. In jurisdictions that do not have reliable registers, lawyers are usually required to verify the power of representation within companies and attest to their findings by way of legal opinions. In the US, the cost of these services alone can easily run into five-digit dollar amounts. Land registers set a record of the entire German territory, providing information on ownerships and land and apartments, as well as any existing engine branches. In contrast to other countries, the content of German land register Grundbuch is indefeasible. This allows for the greatest possible transparency, resulting in real estate transaction being extremely safe and reliable. A buyer can completely rely on the information in the land register and has no need to take out expensive title insurance, as is the case in the US, for example. What's more, thanks to the efficiency to the land register, German real estate transaction costs are comparatively low by international standards. As demonstrated by a Harvard study of this topic conducted in 2007. As a result of register certainty, criminal manipulations such as falsified entries, identity theft, mortgage, fraud or real estate theft, which occur regularly in other highly developed industrial nations, are impossible in Germany. No one has to worry about their data held in current registers being manipulated or misused. The German legal system provides a strong framework for efficient, cost-effective and legally certain loans. Inter alia draft flexible system of loan collaterals such as land mortgage, hypothek or land charge, grundschuld, shuttle mortgage and assignment of receivables. Whoever is registered in the land register as a mortgagee or as beneficiary of a land charge does not have to worry about the borrower becoming insolvent. Such a creditor can realize the property taking priority over all other creditors. This protection has a binding effect on everyone. For this reason, the land register enables banks in Germany to grant real estate loans at particularly favorable terms and much lower interest rates for mortgage loans than are available in many other countries. According to a study carried out by the corporate consultancy Mercer, Oliver Weimann, German banks only add a profit markup of 0.35 percentage points their own cost. In England, this markup is twice as high. A non processory line by way of a chattel mortgage, Sicherungseigentum, and the retention of title secure, the lender, even top the lender is not or no longer in possession of the charter. In this regard, 
German law is considerably more flexible and efficient than other legal systems where a security interest can only be created if the secured party is in position of the shuttle. Furthermore, German law permits the assignment of recitals by way of security. Germany is justifiably proud of its Kurt. For many years now, international studies and empirical data have attested that Germany offers an efficient Kurt system committed to due process and the rule of law. This system has set worldwide standards. Thus, the German judiciary as the third power of the state provides an excellent framework for doing business. Everyone litigating in Germany can really on the independence of German courts. Corruption within the judicial authorities is not an issue in Germany. Germany uses its judicial resources very efficiently. In most cases, litigation is not necessary as the contract drafting stage acts as a form of legal control. German lawyers and civil law notaries who provide competent and proactive advisory services significantly contribute to relieving the courts of some of their burden and thus to the proper functioning of the courts. As a consequence, Germany has the lowest number of law suites within Europe, both on per capita basis as well as in relation to its GNP. A further factor contributing to the predictability of German civil suites is German liability law. As opposed to US courts, German courts do not award extremely high damages. Similarly, the concept of punitive damages is alien to German law, which instead strive to compensate for any actual damage incurred. As a result, the risk involved in any litigation is, to a large degree, both predictable and quantifiable for you as a business. The Rule of Law Index 2011, published by the World Justice Project, which has been examining the implementation of the Rule of Law in 66 countries since 2008, ranks Germany second in the category Access to Civil Justice. Accessibility to the courts their efficiency and effectiveness, and the absence of undue influence characterize the German rule of law. In contrast, the UK is ranked number 10, while the US came in at number 21. Disputes in courts not only center on legal questions but first and foremost around questions of fact. The manner in which a legal system organizes and regulates the taking of evidence is of critical importance to the cost and duration of lawsuits. Here again, German law proves to be particularly efficient and predictable in this regard. In steering the proceedings the court first of all ensures that the parties state their case in full, specifying the evidence they intend to present. The way for that actual taking of evidence is then prepared by orders to take evidence regarding those facts requiring clarification. Carefully balanced rules of evidence distribute 
the onus of proof between the parties. As a rule, each party is required to prove any facts that are advantageous to its claim for position. In Germany, even the taking of highly complex evidence rarely lasts longer than one day. Evidentiary hearings lasting several weeks, as is commonplace in other jurisdictions, are virtually unheard of in German civil proceedings. As opposed to procedural law in the US, German law does not provide for pre-trial discovery prior to the commencement of the actual trial. The parties are therefore not required to enter into a comprehensive exchange of any and all documents and records that may have a bearing on the proceedings. Thanks to its sophisticated rules of evidence, German law is able to dispense with all such preliminary proceedings without compromising the legal process. This saves time and money. Final judgments that can no longer be appealed are enforceable. However, the courts usually declare judgments to be professionally enforceable, even when they have not yet become non-appealable. They prerequisite for this provisional enforceability is that the prevailing party furnishes security, usually in the form of a bank guarantee in order to safeguard the losing party's position. Such security is not even required in proceedings for injunctive relief, relief and summary proceedings. There is hardly other procedural system that provides a similar low-cost solution for the fast enforceability of judgment. What's more, the enforcement of the judgment cannot be delayed through the filing of an appeal. Along with the ordinary courts in Germany, a broad spectrum of dispute resolution procedures offers the right solutions for any kind of dispute. Many judges and lawyers have undergone tra additional training to become qualified mediators. In suitable cases, the court will propose that parties enter into out-of-court settlement of disputes. In Germany, however, the parties have a genuine choice between ending a dispute by way of a court ruling or by settlement in and out of court. The cost and risk of both options are calculable and can be weighed up against each other. In contrast, due to the unpracticable costs and risk of litigation in the US, for example, Parties are in practice often forced to enter into out-of-court settlements. Particularly with regard to international business disputes, Germany's popularity as a venue for arbitration proceedings is continuously growing. German Chambers of Industry and Commerce, ICC, Germany and German Maritime Arbitration Association in Hamburg are internationally prominent arbitral institution. In Germany, numerous legal experts are specialized, specialized in the conduct of arbitration proceedings. They possess a high level of expertise and intercultural sensitivity, thereby facilitating the settlement of disputes and the swift termination of the proceedings. The German rules of arbitration are modeled after the modern and internationally recognized UNCITRAL arbitration 
rules and afford our parties a high degree of flexibility and legal certainty. German arbitration law does not provide for time intensive and therefore costly preliminary proceedings for the taking of evidence, reducing the average duration of arbitration proceedings compared to other jurisdictions. Moreover, the hurry rates of lawyers are significantly lower in Germany than in London, for example. As a consequence, arbitration proceedings in Germany are usually more cost-effective by international standards. At the same time, the relevant UN Convention on truth that arbitration awards cannot just be enforced in Germany and the EU, but in almost all countries around the globe. As a plaintiff in Germany, you are required to advance the current fees and, if required, your lawyer's fees. The defendant, on the other hand, only has to advance his own lawyer's fees. As court and lawyer's fees are prescribed by law and are always based on the value of the matter in dispute, legal costs can be calculated from the outset. The party who wins, the suite will have any costs incurred during the court proceedings reimbursed by the losing party. These costs include any court fees advanced and any advanced payment made for whiteness, booth, ordinary and expert, as well as a fee for the lawyers of both, both parties. German ranks second in the category access to civil justice and the rule of law index 2011. Not Plus, least because of the transparent and affordable lawyers' fees in Germany. Access to justice is therefore ensured, independent of the financial situation of the individual seeking its protection. Thank you for your attention. Spasiva Zabnimania. I think that it's time to ask questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Engelman, and we are handing over to, uh, represent, to representatives of the UK legal system, Michael Todd and John Watton. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. On behalf of the UK delegation, welcome to this session. The UK legal system and its contribution in attracting international businesses and foreign direct investment. My name is Rupert de Cruz. I'm the former chairman of the International Committee of the Council of U English Barristers and its representatives in Russia. I'm also a secretary of the UK-Russian um, Law Association, and this is a great honor for me to speak at this session. On behalf of the delegation from the United Kingdom, Welcome to this session on the United Kingdom's legal system 
and its contribution to attracting international business and foreign direct investment. My name is Rupert de Cruz. I'm Vice Chairman of the English Bar Council's International Committee and its representative for Russia. I'm also Secretary of the British Russian Law Association and it is my privilege to introduce this session to you. The best indicator of a legal system's effectiveness in stimulating economic growth is, I believe, the extent to which that system is actually used by businesses in commercial transactions, and in particular, international commercial transactions. Judged by that benchmark alone, I think it's fair to say that the English law and the English dispute resolution system are strong contributors to economic growth. In 2010, an extensive survey of international businesses was conducted to find out their preferred choice of law for their international contracts and their preferred jurisdiction of choice for international arbitration disputes. It found that given a free choice, 55% of businesses would choose the law of their home jurisdiction, 25% would choose English law, 9% Swiss law, 6% New York law, and 3% French law. However, that does not in fact reflect reality because one party rarely has complete freedom to impose their choice about the governing law of a contract. And the survey found that in reality, the governing laws actually used by companies in their international contracts were English law 44%, New York law 17%, Swiss law 8%, and French law 6%. As far as preferred seats of arbitration are concerned, London was favored by 30% of companies, followed by Geneva 9%, Paris, Tokyo, and Singapore 7%, and New York 6%. So that, according to this survey at least, is the verdict of the market, at least of two years ago. A strong endorsement, I would suggest, of English law and of England as a place for dispute resolution. You will now hear two presentations from the leaders of the legal profession in England and Wales, which will identify the main reasons for this trend. Our first speaker is John Watton, John is the current president of the Law Society of England and Wales, having been appointed in July of last year. He is therefore the leading representative of the solicitor's profession in England and Wales. In private practice, John is an antitrust and com competition specialist. His presentation is about how English contract law facilitates trade and investment. John? Rupert, thank you very much indeed, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk at this distinguished forum on the subject of English contract law. Last year, the uh, UK's Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, Kenneth Clark, said the City of London is a legal centre, not just a financial one, thus making a welcome acknowledgement of a success story that is often overshadowed by its headline-grabbing financial services sector in the city. Among the gleaming offices and skyscrapers serving the financial and professional services industry, some of which have appeared on the screens around this hall, more than half the world's leading law firms have chosen the UK's capital city as their headquarters, ensuring that London has the largest concentration of legal expertise anywhere in the world. Few, if any, other cities offer this combination of specialist and experienced lawyers and business and financial professionals, all within a short walk of one another, both in the uh, expanded old city and at Canary Wharf. At the last count, the UK legal sector was worth 23 billion pounds sterling or 1.8% of GDP 
and it is a major contributor to the UK economy. The importance of high quality legal advice has long been recognized as being central to all financial and business transactions. And coming as I do, as Rupert said, from one of the largest and most international city practices, I have seen at first hand how financial service centers can thrive if they have the right legal framework to support transactions and resolve disputes. At a time when there is an understanding that global competition for legal and financial services is set to intensify, we are fortunate that in England and Wales, and particularly in London, we have a leading position in both of these sectors. Of course, we cannot be complacent. New York, Dubai, Singapore, and Hong Kong are already snapping at our heels, competing with London as hubs of legal expertise. But English law firms are highly valued across the world for the skill and experience they offer in advising their international clients on the drafting and negotiation of contracts and in resolving disputes. Parties negotiating an international transaction frequently choose to use one of the oldest legal systems in the world, our own. A similar choice may be made by contracting parties from a single third country. Parties to a contract may agree that it will be governed by English law and subject to resolution by arbitration or litigation in England. More international and commercial disputes, uh, dispute resolution takes place in London under English law than in any other city in the world. And 90% of commercial disputes handled by London law firms now involve an international party. English law has developed from a combination of statute and case law in which the published, fully reasoned judgments of the courts on decided cases, whether interpreting statutes or building on previous case law, form part of a developing body of law. Our common law system contains guidance on most conceivable areas, and many business people are familiar and comfortable with the principles which underlie it. Therefore, parties, particularly commercial ones, can predict with greater certainty than in many civil law systems how a contractual term is likely to be interpreted and whether the courts will give full effect to its terms. This gives them more, a more detailed context in which to make any commercial decision. This is even more appealing for litigants for whom the interpretation of the law in their own countries may be unpredictable or undeveloped, or if their judges are inexperienced in handling these types of cases. English contract law is adaptable and achieves a sensible balance between predictability and flexibility. As a common law system, our judges decide what the law is when there is no other authoritative statement of the law. Interpreting past rulings in the context of modern business methods and needs, ensuring that precedent is always a servant, but never a master. The development over the centuries of the common law, overlaid as it has been by equity, taken together with our doctrine of precedent, has provided the certainty required by those undertaking international business. The doctrine of precedent requires that the English courts are bound in relation to points of law by earlier decisions on those same points of law made by courts of a superior jurisdiction, and save in exceptional circumstances will follow decisions of courts of equal jurisdiction. Thus, a first instance judge will be bound by a decision of the Court of Appeal or Supreme Court, and generally will follow decisions of judges of equivalent standing to his or her own. The equitable jurisdiction of the courts was initially developed to afford relief, where appropriate, from the harshness and rigors of the common law. In so doing, it has introduced a greater degree of flexibility than that given by the common law and its procedures. The doctrine of precedent means that English law can evolve more quickly than code-based law in order to adapt to current practices and behavior 
as demanded by a modern, global, and interconnected world. It also aids consistency and predictability, making common law attractive to business, which places a necessary emphasis on these twin qualities. In England, our law is based on the principle of freedom of contract. Party autonomy is paramount, and parties are able to agree terms between themselves with confidence that the courts will give effect to them. It is only in specific instances, such as when terms are found to be for an illegal purpose, or the term is otherwise contrary to public policy, that it can be invalidated. This key principle, where parties are bound by the terms of their agreement, is attractive to commercial parties. English law allows the parties to agree the precise rights and obligations which fall upon the, each party, allowing the parties much greater freedom of contract than under many civil codes. The lack of a codified structure under which a contract might be declared void on technical grounds means that parties that litigate over an English law contract know that English courts or arbitrators will construe an agreement according to its own terms. If both parties have made a deal, then English law will give effect to it. A decision by an English court can be easily enforced within the European Union and outside the EU. The UK is party to a number of international conventions allowing for mutual recognition and enforcement of court judgments and arbitral awards. English lawyers are bound by our professional rules to keep the affairs of our clients and former clients confidential, bar a few clear and narrowly defined exceptions. Legal professional privilege is firmly established and has been consistently upheld by court decisions despite attempts to undermine this fundamental aspect of the relationship between a lawyer and his or her client. Confidential communications between a lawyer and the client which come into existence for the purpose of giving or obtaining legal advice are privileged. Also privileged in a litigation contract are communications with third parties for the purpose of giving or obtaining legal advice or collecting evidence for use in litigation. Attempts to settle disputes are also protected from disclosure by rules on without prejudice communications. English courts also offer speedy interim in judgments and a range of remedies for international cases, including asset freezing worldwide, search and seizure orders to obtain and preserve evidence, prohibitory injunctions preventing a party from taking action, and mandatory injunctions, which conversely force a party to take action. I'm in no doubt that the benefits of using English law will ensure that London continues to thrive as a global legal centre. International corporations can choose English law knowing that it is based on hundreds of years of case law and is respected across the world. Thank you. Thank you, John. Our second distinguished speaker is Michael Todd. Michael is Queen's Counsel and Chairman of the Bar of England and Wales for 2012. He therefore leads the barrister side of the legal profession in England and Wales. Michael is a leading company law practitioner and he will now present to you on the effective assistance that English litigation and arbitration provides in protecting property and commercial rights. Michael. Uh, thank you very much, Rupert. Uh, it's per perhaps unsurprising that given its position as an iron nation uh, and its history, that Britain has for centuries been at the forefront of international, indeed global, trade and investment. Nevertheless, the success of its role in international trade and finance could never have been assured without the necessary infrastructure and services which it developed to enable it to prosper. But it has indeed done so. And whilst England, because of its size, may no longer be at the forefront of international trade, its legacy in terms of that infrastructure and those services has been bequeathed, is available too, and is employed increasingly by those who have overtaken England in terms of market share of international trade. There are many facets to this, just as there are many reasons for the choice of England for the resolution 
of international disputes. Of course, central to any trade, whether that be domestic or international, are contracts. That is, agreements which define the rights of the parties as between each other and the obligations of each, of each one of them to the other of them in relation to the business or transactions which the parties intend to conduct. It is the maturity of its law of contract which has assured the preeminence of England at the heart of international trade. Historically, England established around the globe institutions and systems based upon its own models. Naturally, such systems included our system of law and legal administration, and in particular, our system of contract law, as England traded with its partners around the globe. But it's not just amongst our trading partners that there is a preponderance of those uh, selecting English law of the law of choice as the law of choice for the contracts that they are entering into. And John Watton has already talked about the importance of English contract law uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, the attractiveness of the jurisdiction of England and Wales for the resolution of international business and other, le and other legal disputes appears to know no bounds. As John has said, the services of its practitioners accounted for some £23.1 billion, equivalent to 1.8% of the UK's gross domestic product. That is attributable to both the expert advisory and advocacy services provided by those practitioners to foreign clients in their own domestic jurisdictions, and increasingly in the UK as more and more international parties select the courts of England and Wales as a dispute resolution jurisdictions of choice. As John has said, in jurisprudential terms, the development over the centuries of the common law, overlaid as it has been by equity, taken together with our doctrine of precedent, has provided the certainty required by those undertaking international business. This doctrine is important not only for the incremental and, un and principled development of our jurisprudence, but it's also important to businesses, to finance and to commerce for the certainty and predictability of outcomes which it affords. It is that bedrock of certainty that has, enab that has enabled both the common law and equity to continue to develop incrementally and flexibly to meet the ever-changing and increasingly challenging needs of the business community with the necessary degree of predictability. As trade and business is conducted ever more globally and international business uh, and financial structures have become ever more complicated and esoteric in their nature and effect, the predictability which our system affords is indeed at a premium. Just as our jurisprudence has developed to meet the demands of both domestic and international business, so too have the protections and remedies afforded by our courts. Perhaps the most widely known and extensive remedy is the freezing order or injunction. Such orders may be made, I say may because they're discretionary, that is to say they're equitable in nature, but to protect and preserve the property, that property or those rights and to avoid their dissipation. Uh, their development has been incremental, their scope and avail availability being fashioned according to the particular circumstances of the case and taking account of the commercial imperatives of the parties. Such orders may be made as a final order upon determination of a dispute or, and very frequently, on an interim basis during the course of the proceedings to protect and preserve the subject matter of the dispute. Orders such as those are often enforced and supported as a matter of community in foreign jurisdictions or by the grant of, fi of foreign restraining orders. The development of our system of law has provided the courts with a wide range and armory of flexible remedies. By way of example, the courts may make an order, as John has said, requiring a party in breach of its contractual terms to perform those obligations as an alternative or in addition to making, an award, to making an award of damages by way of remedy. Similarly, the courts may restrain actions taken to undermine or in breach of contract. The courts have specific powers uh, for protecting and preserving assets, the subject matter of a dispute, as I say, either on an interim basis or by way of final order. 
they have specific powers to prevent a party dissipating its assets uh, so, that it, so as to make itself judgment proof or to render nugatory any award made against it. The court may also make orders requiring disclosure of those assets in aid of any orders for enforcement of a judgment or order which it makes. The, U the UK government has invested in the delivery of our legal services for international business. Just last year, Her Majesty the Queen opened the new Rolls Building, a business court complex in which are housed 50 judges, being the judges of the Chancery Division, the Admiralty and Commercial Court, and the Technology and Construction Court of the High Court of Justice. The Rolls Building, the largest business court complex in the world, encompasses facilities for all forms of dispute resolution, from litigation to mediation and to arbitration. And it's perhaps unsurprising that one of the first cases to be heard in the new Rolls Building involved a dispute between Berezovsky and Abramovich. The jurisdiction of the court was engaged because Berezovsky is, of course, resident in the United Kingdom. He caused Abramovich to be served with proceedings whilst he, Abramovich, was in England. The trial, one of the most high profile of this last year, was a testament to the new ways of working in the courts, from e-documentation to simul simultaneous translation of witness evidence. Not only do foreign litigants find our courts attractive for resolution of their disputes, so too do they choose English law as the law of their contracts and London as a seat of, of any arbitration to which they refer any disputes under those contracts. The attractiveness of, of London as the seat of arbitration is enhanced by the range of interim relief available from the English courts to support any such arbitration. The availability and effectiveness of the sanctions, of sanctions to uphold and enforce arbitration agreements, including anti-suit injunctions, and the strict enforcement of arbitral awards with limited rights of appeal. At a seminar which I attended last year, which was addressed by our Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, the Right Honourable Kenneth Clark, QC, MP, leaders in business, commerce and finance, when asked what they required uh, from the court process, uh, all said that they required both cost-effective and quick dispute resolution. <coughs> These very matters were considered some ten years ago by Lord Wolfe, he proposed substantial reforms to civil procedure and, and as a result of which new civil procedure rules were introduced. Those new rules provided amongst other things for more proactive case management of cases so as to ensure that cases were resolved on the, in the most cost efficient and proportionate manner. Those rules have been subject to yet, of yet further review. The cost of civil litigation have been the subject of a recent review by, the court, by a Court of Appeal judge, Sir Rupert Jackson. He has reported and his reforms are presently being implemented. At the centre of his uh, reforms are more rigorous and more proactive case management and the docketing of judges, that is to say, the assignment of judges to cases from commencement through to final resolution. <clears throat> In relation to the speed of uh, dispute resolution, the Bar Council, of which I'm presently chairman, has recently established a small working group to look, at the, to look at this issue. The work of the group has the support of senior members of the judiciary in England and Wales and of government. It is clear to me on the international trips I have undertaken to the Far East, to the Middle East, to Europe and to the United States that practitioners in all jurisdictions regard England and Wales as leading the common law world in terms of the integrity of our judicial system, the independence and incorruptibility of our judiciary, in terms of our jurisprudence, our ethical standards and our regulatory standards, and in the way in which we deliver our legal services. But such a privileged position brings with it certain responsibilities. Responsibilities, that is, uh, with which we are obliged to comply and which we are only too willing to embrace. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from the leaders of the English legal profession about English contract law and the English dispute resolution system and their contributions 
to trade and economic growth. We'd be very pleased to field any questions that you may have. Yes, Paprosi. Thank you very much for this presentation. One of the speakers mentioned interim remedies in his speech, and I was wondering if you could have more details on that, and especially how are they enforced in practice? Thank you. So the enforcement of interim remedies in practice. Michael, would you like to deal with that? Certainly. The, um, the court is very strict in enforcing its, in, its interim remedies because, of course, Interim remedies are there, of course, to preserve the subject matter of the dispute. They're also there to ensure compliance uh, with its procedures. So, for example, if a court um, grants, by way, of, by way of example, an interim injunction, a restraining order, restraining a party from doing something, possibly restraining the party from dealing with an asset, the subject matter of the dispute, that is to say, perhaps restraining a sale, preventing a sale of the asset, the subject matter of a dispute. If, the, if a person acts in breach of that order of the court, the court has very, very wide powers indeed. It, because any, a breach, of course, of such an interim order uh, constitutes a contempt of court. And uh, the court, when it is faced with a contempt of, uh, when it's faced with a contempt of court, can require the person acting in breach of its order to appear before it and to explain its actions. But it goes further than that. The court can, if it finds the contempt, that is, the breach proven, then the court can fine that person for acting in breach of its order. It may also, uh, it may also issue an order preventing that person acting in breach of its own orders uh, from leaving the jurisdiction of the High Court. So it can make sure that the person which acts in breach of its orders can be brought before it to explain and to, and to remedy, so far as possible, the breaches of the order. But it goes yet even further than that, because the ultimate sanction for a breach of a court order is, of course, imprisonment. And I have seen, a number of, on a number of occasions, the courts imprisoning a party and acting in breach of its orders. Uh, and it will do so for... A, usually a limited period, but it will require the person it, it imprisons uh, to appear before it after a period of time, to seek an explanation from that party, to seek an apology from that party for the breach of the court's order. And it may, if, if satisfied that the, the breach has been remedied or is capable of being remedied, and that true contrition is shown by the person who's acted in breach, then the court may possibly just find the person acting in breach or allow it, allow it to be released from prison and uh, with, with no further sanction. So the court has all these sanctions. It, may, it will certainly bring the contemnor, as we call him, before it uh, to explain why, it's acted in, why he's acted in breach. It may fine that person. It may imprison that person. And it will certainly require some reparation in some form or other. So the court does take very, very seriously breaches of its interim orders. Thank you. Just, just to add a, a practical example of that, in um, a current very high profile CIS case before the English courts, the court imposed an 18 month imprisonment sentence on the defendant for failing to disclose his, his assets, BTA and Abiazo. Um, so th there's a, a, an actual example of contempt of court in practice. Any other questions? In which case, um, thank you for your attention. It's a great honor for us to be able to speak with this presentation. I hope that the presentations were interesting and useful for you. Thank you. We are grateful to the representatives of the UK legal system for the wonderful presentation, and we are handing over to representatives of the US legal system, the US Bar Association.
My name is Lisa Sabat. I am with Crowell and Mooring in Washington, D.C., and also I'm here as a representative of the American Bar Association Section of International Law. And I want to thank the organizers of this conference, including the Minister of Justice, for inviting us. And it is truly wonderful to see so many lawyers from around the world having a chance to have a dialogue together, and also to see so many young lawyers here. As some of you know, it's, uh, the U.S. legal system is similar in some ways to the UK legal system as it is a common law system and it includes both statutes and reliance on case law. The US has in essence 51 legal systems, one federal system and 50 states with its own statutes and case law. We decided to focus on three aspects of US law just to give you an idea on three topics that might be of interest to international lawyers and international legal community. I will discuss recent U.S. Supreme Court cases on the topic of personal jurisdiction over foreign companies. Glenn Hendricks will discuss international arbitration in the U.S. And Glenn Bird will discuss a statute, Section 1782, which is a way uh, for foreign uh, litigants to obtain evidence in the United States. And as alluded to by the uh, German Bar and others, uh, the U.S. system is known for being a little litigious, uh, but it is also one of the largest consumer uh, markets for the world. And there is a tension between global trade and state sovereignty. Various developments, including the Internet and other global trends, can be used against foreign companies in the United States. And this is seen in the area of whether U.S. courts can exercise personal jurisdiction over a foreign company. Personal jurisdiction is based mostly on state statutes, but it also has an element for federal due process concept. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to focus on two very recent June 2011 U.S. Supreme Court cases in the area of personal jurisdiction over foreign companies. And this is the first time that the United States Supreme Court has addressed this issue in almost 30 years. And so it is of great interest, particularly for foreign litigants. And just to remind everyone, the U.S. Supreme Court is the highest court in the U.S., and both state courts and federal courts are obligated to follow the United States Supreme Court law. The first case has to do with specific jurisdiction, which is the concept of a court making a finding that there is jurisdiction where there's a specific connection between the dispute and the forum. The name of the case was McCastro versus, I'm sorry, McIntyre versus Nicastro. This case involved an English manufacturer of machinery who exported the machinery to its Ohio distributor. That Ohio distributor later sold the machine to a company in New Jersey, and ultimately a worker at that company was injured by the machine, and a suit was filed in New Jersey. The lower court in New Jersey found jurisdiction under what we call the stream of commerce theory, which is basically when you have a component or, or, or a product that you put into the stream of commerce anywhere in the world, but it ends up in the United States, there could possibly be jurisdiction. And the foreign company knows that the product could end up there. That was the current state and that's what of the law, and that's what the lower court found. The lower court also as a matter of public policy, noted that due process should not provide a safe harbor allowing foreign corporations to ship potentially dangerous products to the U.S., driving American manufacturers out of business. This ultimately went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court issued a split decision, but while the lower court granted personal jurisdiction, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed that decision. The Supreme Court found that the nationwide distribution system of a company in the U.S. will not subject a foreign manufacturer to jurisdiction in a particular state. The Supreme Court also said that foreseeability and awareness is not enough to exert personal jurisdiction. The defendant's actions, not their expectations of where that product could end up, was determinative. So really what the courts will look at is whether or not there was a target or a concentration on a particular state before a court will exercise jurisdiction in that state. However, 
It's not clear, as there was a strong concurring opinion which disagree with some of the reasoning of this decision, which could weaken the effect of decision. And there's also a strong dissent. And there was a fear that foreign companies would use a distributor to avoid suits in the United States. Justice Ginsburg, who wrote for the dissent, also was worried about fairness to the injured plaintiff and the burden on the plaintiff to have to bring a lawsuit in a foreign jurisdiction. And remember, in the United States, particularly in personal injury field, we have contingency fees, which means it's not very expensive for a person to hire a lawyer in the United States because they just uh, will get, the lawyer will get a percentage if they succeed, and the loser uh, doesn't necessarily have to pay legal fees. They don't. So it's much more difficult for a person, an injured person in the United States, to go to another country, and that is what Justice Ginsburg focused on. However, there's also a burden on the foreign company to defend in another country, namely the United States, and to spend significant fees in the litigation. So the Nicastro case has actually left a lot unsettled for foreign companies. What wasn't discussed in the Nicastro case also is a situation where goods or products are sold through the internet. That case is coming soon. Or where it's sold on the internet through an intermediate such as Amazon.com and the product is then sold in the United States. Also, how the internet and other advertisement might be seen in a specific jurisdiction. So, while the decision is hailed by representatives or lawyers for foreign companies as a good decision, it still remains unsettled as to what will happen. The second Supreme Court decision, which was issued the same day, in fact, both decisions, I'm sorry, both cases were heard on the same day before the Supreme Court was about general jurisdiction, which is where there's not necessarily a connection between the dispute and the forum, but the court looks at whether there's continuous and systematic contacts with the state by the foreign company, or whether there was um, this concept of doing business in the foreign state. And in this case, it was called Goodyear Dunlop Tires versus Brown, these were tires that were manufactured by a subsidiary of Goodyear in Turkey. The accident happened in France. It was a bus accident, and two children from the state of North Carolina were killed. The lawsuit was brought in North Carolina. These foreign companies, the subsidiaries of Goodyear, um, one was Turkish and one was from Luxembourg, were not registered to do business in North Carolina, had no bank accounts in North Carolina, and did not ship products to the U.S. However, the North Carolina State Court found jurisdiction saying that although these particular tires were not for use in the United States, there were other products manufactured by these subsidiaries which through the parent company found their way to the U.S. And that there is less of a burden on these big corporations and that we had to protect North Carolina citizens. That was the State Court. The U.S. Supreme Court in a unanimous decision written by Justice Ginsburg, reversed the lower court and found there was no jurisdiction over Goodyear in Turkey. And Justice Ginsburg talked about a high standard where the dispute does not involve the forum and looking to see if the corporation was essentially at home in that jurisdiction. And that is going to be subject to interpretation. Does it mean whether or not the corporation had, was incorporated in that state before a lawsuit could be brought? Or could there be some other level of continuous and systematic activity for which a court could base this decision that general jurisdiction would apply? But it is a good decision for foreign manufacturers and it will hopefully decrease the risk to foreign companies. But we will see uh, what lower courts will do and often the lower courts do mix up, unfortunately, the concepts of specific and general jurisdiction. So for foreign companies, and not just manufacturers, they need to be thinking about their distribution chain, what kind of choice of law clause they might have in a contract, how and where they're targeting their advertising, and also what other defenses might be available to a foreign company if they get sued in the United States and personal jurisdiction is found. There are other tools, which I won't talk about here, but happy to address uh, in a different forum. 
such as a forum nonconvenience, finding that it's an inconvenient forum, or even the application of foreign law. Uh, this is often used or tried to be used as a tool to reduce the amount of damages in the United States. So these two decisions may not dramatically change the legal landscape for foreign companies, but it's hoped that they will. And it also throws the decision about what foreign manufacturers might face in a way to our Congress. And in fact, in 2011, there was a proposed legislation called the Foreign Manufacturers Legal Accountability Act. And this act was driven by the fear of products flooding the U.S. market that might not be safe and is really very consumer driven. There were hearings on this proposed legislation which would require foreign companies to register in at least one state of the United States if they were going to send products to the U.S. and that registration in one state would give all 50 states jurisdiction over that company. That legislation has not even come out of committee and we'll see whether it will be revived at some point. So we will see what these two cases will mean for foreign companies, but foreign companies should be thinking about uh, what risks they might have, whether it's products or services in coming to the United States. But uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has spoken and trying to restrict that risk, and hopefully there'll be further decisions that will elucidate on these concepts, including uh, decisions about the internet, which I think will be very, very interesting decisions. Anyway, thank you. I'd like to now introduce Glenn Hendricks. Well, thank you, Lisa. I was asked to make a few remarks about the United States as a seat for international arbitration. And I know it's late, it's been a very long day, so I'll keep this very brief. And the good news is I can keep it brief because there's not a whole lot about the United States when it comes to international arbitration that is terribly unique from any of the other major international arbitration centers in the world. Um, most centers of international arbitration have several things in common. Uh, they're the sorts of things you've already heard from with respect to the other jurisdictions represented here today. You've got an open, transparent, um, honest judiciary. You've got a legislation and a judicial system that's very supportive of arbitration. Uh, you have an infrastructure in terms of travel and technical communications that is supportive. Uh, you've got to have a place that's very easy to get to. And Frankly, it has to be a very nice place to visit uh, because you're bringing people from other places. And certainly, the United States meets all of those criteria. And so, what I'll focus on is in those very few um, areas in which the United States is different. Um, and, and like I said, 90%, 95% even perhaps, uh, we would share overlap with the other jurisdictions we've already heard from. A few things about the United States, I think that you'll hear first of all uh, the question of the extent to which U.S. litigation practices bleed into arbitration. And you've heard a little bit about it uh, from the Germans and from the French. And the issue that comes up is to what extent, for example, will our discovery practices, um, to what extent do those also bleed into arbitration proceedings in the United States? And the answer is, it depends. It's purely a function of party autonomy. Uh, and there's great respect for party autonomy in the United States when it comes to arbitration. So if the parties want discovery, and there are many cases in which they would, discovery uh, is a device that's designed to get to the truth of the matter, uh, and there are many cases in which it's useful, uh, then the arbitrator will allow it. If the parties have entered into a contract or adopted arbitral rules which do not provide for extensive discovery, whether it's through the ICC or the LCIA or even the ICDR, which is the U.S.-based international arbitration institution, then the discovery will be very narrow along the lines of the uh, IBA rules of evidence in international arbitrations. And so 
I think you'll find a common theme with respect to arbitration in the United States is flexibility and respect for party autonomy. Uh, another issue that you'll hear about in the United States is the fact that uh, our legal system, although it's partly codified, is a common law system. Uh, very much what you heard about the, uh, the English system in the UK. Uh, arbitration is governed partly by statute. We have the Federal Arbitration Act of 1925 and since been amended in 1970 uh, to incorporate international elements, uh, but also a great body of case law. Uh, and as discussed by John Wooten with uh, the Law Society of England and Wales, this is a good thing because any code, no matter how detailed, no matter how well thought out it is, there are going to be gaps. There are going to be issues and areas in which there is need for interpretation. And you can turn to this body of case law to answer these questions, and it makes the outcome and the results much more predictable. And it's something I would say uh, a little bit similar to what you see emerging in the Russian Federation with all of the, uh, the precedent from the Supreme Arbitrage Court, which is readily available and helps answer questions that you may have. And so you've got this body of case law, um, which I think, again, makes the system very transparent, very open, and very uh, uh, predictable. The other thing I would say about the United States uh, is something that was mentioned by Lisa Sabat, is that you have really 51 bodies of law. It's a large country. Um, it's also a federal system, so you've got a system of federal laws and federal courts, and then also state courts, each with their own defined areas of competence. And what that means is that there is some variability uh, depending on where in the United States you choose to arbitrate a dispute, and it's something that counsel need to be very careful and give some thought to before they pick a place of arbitration. Again, the vast majority of legal issues with respect to arbitration will be the same regardless of whether you arbitrate in New York, Atlanta, Miami, Chicago, Houston, or wherever, but there is some room for variation, and I'll just go over some of those issues very quickly now. One very important issue relates to foreign lawyer practice, the extent to which a non-U.S. lawyer can appear in an international arbitration in the United States and argue the case or sit as an arbitrator. And there's great variability between the U.S. states on this topic. Uh, California, which would be one of the most attractive places to arbitrate, has a very restrictive rules um, with respect to non-U.S. lawyers. And of course, if you've got an arbitration that is between, say, a, a Russian party and a Chinese party uh, governed by, say, English law, well, you're going to want French, you're going to want Russian lawyers, you're going to want Chinese lawyers, you're going to want English lawyers involved in that arbitration. Fortunately, there are a number of states in the U.S. that have very open and liberal um, regimes in this regard. New York is one of those regimes that's very open. Um, Florida and Miami is very open. Uh, the state of Georgia and Atlanta is very open. And so you have to just know this before choosing your, your place of arbitration. The other issue is the grounds for setting aside an award, for annulment of an award. Um, and this is another area or issue in which there's some variability within the United States. Um, you may have heard of this doctrine uh, called manifest disregard of the law, uh, which is followed in some parts of the United States, but not in others. Um, the doctrine is a very narrow one that allows a court to set aside an arbitration award if the arbitrator, in effect, consciously disregarded the law. So that there's evidence that the arbitrator knew what the law was, um, but very consciously and knowingly chose not to apply the law. So it's obviously a very narrow, very unusual circumstance. And in fact, in an international arbitration case, it has never, ever once been applied to set aside an award. But there's at least the possibility of doing it in some parts of the United States. Um, New York is one of those places in the Second Circuit. Um, uh, Miami 
Uh, Atlanta, Houston, again, are uh, cities and areas of the country, judicial circuits, in which it is not possible to use this ground. And different parties may look at this differently. And uh, some parties may like having that option of being able to go to court, um, set aside an award on these very narrow grounds, which would be very egregious if it were to happen. On the other hand, other parties may want a situation where they want finality to the award. They don't want the arbitration just to be the first step, a preliminary step in the litigation that ultimately you've got judicial review. And again, though, what you have is flexibility. You have options. So if you're looking to arbitrate in the United States, if you want the possibility of manifest disregard, of the, then you pick New York or another jurisdiction which allows this. If you don't want it, then you would pick Miami, Atlanta, Houston, one of those cities uh, which do not. So again, it comes down to um, flexibility and choice and options. I would say a final advantage uh, to arbitrate in the states, and it's one that is, it's almost mundane um, and obvious, but it's simply cost. Uh, the U.S. is now among the major developed economies of the world. It is perhaps the cheapest in terms of hotels, in terms of cost for service providers, including lawyers, if you look at the hourly rates, um, look at transportation. Uh, the U.S. is much cheaper than many of the other jurisdictions. And of course, cost is very much a factor these days for companies and corporations in looking at uh, how and where uh, they're going to resolve their disputes. And then finally, as you've seen from some, I believe, some of the pictures that were uh, behind us earlier when uh, Lisa was talking, the U.S. is a very nice place to visit. <laughs> and so uh, you don't want to lose sight of that, and uh, you would all be very welcome, uh, Dabro Bajalovic, uh, to come and uh, resolve your dispute in uh, the United States. So our next and final speaker will be Gene Bird, and Gene is going to talk about a very narrow issue um, which relates to using this device, that, uh, this discovery device, in aid of litigation or arbitrations which are not in the U.S., but that are taking place elsewhere, whether they're in England or France or Russia, um, basically using the U.S. courts as a means to provide assistance. Добрый вечер. Меня зовут Джин Бур. Good afternoon. My name is Jean Bouvard. I'm a lawyer with Arnold Goldman and Gregory in Washington, D.C. I am also a co-chair of the Committee on Russia, Eurasia, uh, and uh, the section of international legislation of American Bar Association. I would like to welcome you all in this room today and I promise that my presentation is not going to be very long but if you want to ask question afterwards I'll be happy to take them as my colleague said I wanted to devote my presentation to a unique uh, phenomenon of the US legal system that allows you to get information evidence that can be used in uh, court trials and arbitration processes international outside uh, the US even in those cases where neither of the parties involved doesn't have is uh, neither of them is a, a US based side let's imagine a situation whereby a Russian company enters into agreement with a German company on the basis of this agreement they establish a joint venture with the goal of obtaining or using a license of an American a big American firm in Russia in the Russian marketplace they want to produce something or they want to develop some products and then sell them under the license from a US company. For some reason, a dispute follows and say, for example, uh, in this contract it is stated that uh, disputes should be settled in Germany. 
As we heard from our German colleagues, German courts are very effective, very fast, and they do not care about such things as additional evidence, additional documents. They just look into the eyes of a person and determine who is right within the shortest possible period of time. What a Russian company should do in that case? How can we get documents that will show that the German company was in breach of a contract, that the German company had promised something, had promised to fulfill certain obligations, some actions, but never did so. In this case, on the basis of the U.S. law, the Russian company has an opportunity, has a possibility to apply to a U.S. court and request documents from the U.S. company uh, that was supposed to issue the license, although that license wasn't issued. And if the Russian party thinks that this was because of an action or inaction of, uh, on the part of the German party, maybe the German party didn't carry out those um, actions that it was supposed to carry out, didn't do that, it didn't uh, in, but, uh, take part in the negotiations, and this German company claims that it was in compliance, but there are no uh, evidence in support of that, because the evidence is in the U.S. So the U.S., the Russian company in that case can apply to a U.S. court and request uh, the court to issue a court order so that the U.S. company provides documentation, provides evidence, maybe hard evidence related to this matter. Of course, we can say that there are many situations where such a law can be helpful. There may be situations where the party asking for evidence in the U.S. is not acting in good faith, is not acting in the interests of justice, but is acting in its own interests. Therefore, Article 1782 says that the obligations of the U.S. court are not absolute and have to be assessed on the basis of certain specific uh, circumstances. And those circumstances, those principles that may serve as a reason to determine whether to issue or not such a court order so if the well, and those principles were defined by the Supreme Court of the Russian of uh, sorry the United States of America in a case related to Europe ATM versus Intel it was an interesting case from a number of perspectives not ADM AMD yes versus Intel AMD in that case stated, or rather applied to the European Antitrust uh, Agency and said that Intel is a monopoly and they asked to start a, an investigation into Intel in Europe. And they also applied uh, to the U.S. court in order to get information from Intel. There were certain procedural actions underway, lower courts were involved, and when uh, the case uh, was uh, transferred to the Supreme Court of the U.S., this court ruled that in order to get evidence in the United States, it is not necessary that these, this evidence could be used in the 
court trial in the country from which the application comes. Uh, it is enough for, for this evidence to have a bearing on the mat subject matter of the dispute. Another interesting point that was discussed there was related to legal procedures uh, with regard to which the evidence is requested. And the court ruled that such evidence should be collected in connection with official uh, investigations and maybe even arbitration processes. So under certain circumstances, even in arbitration proceedings, it is possible to resort to it. This case, even if it was handled in Geneva or in London, it is possible for a Russian company to apply to an American court with such a request and a certain order is issued. We can talk at length about uh, Regulation 1782, but we are pressed for time. I don't want to delay you, so if you have any questions, please ask them. If there are no questions, thank you very much for your attention. All the best to you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.